Welcome to TAFAF Coffee Talks. Very happy to have you here. I would ask you also please to check your cell phones. The event is live streamed right now on Facebook. So it's a live event on Facebook. After the panels are edited, they go up onto the website permanently so you can see everything that we've done since fall of 2016. We regard these panels as serious resources for educational research now and in the future. So we come at them from that point of view and with not only the idea of being entertaining and exciting for the audience, but having a high level of intellectual rigor. And I'm sure that you're going to find that in this panel today. Now I have to introduce our moderator, Tom Lohman, who is the director of Wadsworth Athenaeum and a friend of this fair and a friend of this program who has been a panelist many times and is helming this wonderful panel today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda, and thank you all for coming. It's, uh, I don't know if this is the marathon effect. We're all trapped on the Upper East Side. <laughs> uh, but I rather like to prefer uh, seeing so many friends who collect, who publish, uh, who are in the trade, who are in academe, who are in museums in this room is, is really heartening. Our topic today is a, mar a marvelous one and kind of an evergreen one, uh, the Devines. Uh, there I was, an undergraduate at Georgetown in the late 1980s, when I asked Doug Lewis, so where did all this furniture in the Widener collection come from? And he handed me a book and said, you need to learn about Joe Devine. Uh, it was later in graduate school, looking for a dissertation topic, that I opened a book and I said, who took all these photographs? And someone else handed me another book and said, that's Clarence Kennedy. It all goes back to Devine. And so uh, what we're going to try to do this morning is talk a little bit from four very distinct uh, perspectives about the Devine phenomenon, not so much cast in amber uh, as something that happened 100 years ago, but that's something that's still happening today, uh, what we can learn from it, and uh, how each of us can connect with this legacy or are shaped, uh, whether we know it or not, uh, by those wonderful things that were happening 100 years ago. And joining me to, to guide us through this story are some wonderful friends and colleagues. I want to start by introducing each of them. Uh, to, my, uh, to, to, to my right, immediately, uh, Rebecca Tillis. She's the associate curator at Hillwood. Um, and in Washington, D.C. And she recently uh, organized an exhibition called Perfume and Seduction, uh, which uh, used important loans uh, from the private collection of Givaudian in Paris, uh, which joined Marjorie Metherweather Post's wonderful legacy. Uh, so, such great perfume bottles, such great objets, uh, kind of the, the zenith of American collecting in the Duveen taste. Uh, Rebecca's a PhD candidate, although she's finished her dissertation, uh, on George and Florence Blumenthal, uh, you know, another great New York couple. It's called uh, The Blumenthal is a Collecting Partnership in the Gilded Age, and we were just chatting earlier about how her research was primarily conducted in France. We often think of American uh, collectors as being people who one's research is here in New York, but uh, I'm, I'm delighted to know that it's much farther afield. She uh, began her museum career at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, uh, having uh, graduated from Wellesley, then Bard, and uh, a, a uh, stage at the Ecole de Louvre <coughs> Paris. Uh, to her right, my good friend Asso Tavidian. Uh, Asso is a, a, a New Yorker, and he's also a resident of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And he's the founder of Sink Sort uh, in 1969. He, his, his deep interest in international affairs, the performing arts, and educational philanthropy is only matched by the, his accomplishment as a contemporary collector uh, in precisely the material that, that drove the Devine effect uh, forward 100 years ago. Uh, he sits on the boards of several nonprofits, including the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Frick here in New York. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and uh, I, I'm just delighted that we have, get to have this uh, marvelous conversation with one of the leading collectors uh, here in the city. So thank you, Asso. Uh, to his right, Charlotte Vignon. Uh, what can we say about Charlotte? I mean, she's uh, a, a real phenomenon uh, since coming to America and joining uh, the, the museum community just after 9-11. Uh, 
Uh, Charlotte's an expert in European decorative arts. She's done numerous shows at the Frick on Sev, Meissen, uh, and other topics. Uh, but it's, it's her PhD dissertation, which has just been turned into a book that was really the impetus for today's panel, uh, looking particularly at the Devines and the taste for the decorative arts in America. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Charlotte. And, and finally, uh, Alexi Kugel, uh, owner with his brother Nicholas, of Gallery Kugel, which is perhaps the most divine and elegant uh, sale uh, room in, in all of Paris, uh, on the on the Quai Anatole. And uh, Alexei is, is both an art dealer and an art historian. Uh, their, their research library at the gallery is unbelievable. And he's often co-authored uh, with members from academe and uh, uh, the museum community. Who could forget his, his last uh, exhibition, Piquet? Uh, gold tortoise and mother of pearl at the court of Naples, which was a revelation to so many. Uh, so many people have come up to me and said, you know, I had things, I didn't know what they were. And then Kugel did the show that crystallized the idea and brought it all home for everyone. Uh, so those are our panelists. Uh, please welcome them. <laughs> I thought we'd start today with uh, a little bit of personal storytelling. You know, the Devines, uh, ever, you're all here because you're fascinated by the Devines uh, in different ways, but I'd like to ask our panelists uh, to each tell us briefly about their first contact with the name Duveen, with the look Duveen. And Alexia, I thought we'd start with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I was uh, probably uh, given the book uh, by Berman on Duveen, uh, I don't know if it's by my father, but uh, as a, as a, a child uh, 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 night table book. Uh, so I was fed with this um, extraordinary stories uh, um, as a, almost a child or a, t a teenager. It's, it's certainly not a book which is meant to be a, uh, uh, a, a guideline for any uh, one who wants to enter uh, the art market as a dealer. But um, it is great to have a uh, uh, to know where the ultimate limit is uh, uh, in order to 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 realize where one stands. Uh, and uh, all the ad uh, adjectives uh, that describe Duveen, um, I think, are, are, are right. Uh, as uh, he has not, he hadn't been uh, surpassed, and he hasn't been surpassed. Uh, uh, within the history of, uh, of uh, the art market. Indeed. Charlotte, same question. It's a little bit like you. I, was, uh, I left Paris um, to arrive at the Cleveland Museum of Art. I was just not even 25. And at the time, it was Henry Holley, um, the great uh, curator, who hired me to, to catalog the collection of 18th century French decorative arts at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And there, I was just like, he sent me on a trip all over the US and to study all of the collection. I went to Detroit. I was received by the great uh, curators everywhere and LA and San Francisco and, and every, every, all great collections and, and museums. And all the time I said, why all of these objects there? And why this quality? And also I could already see a certain taste there were certain objects in every single collection that kind of, it was, you feel that there were a moment of simi some similarities with all of these collections that I can, I felt at the time. And each time I go and study to collect and uh, study these collections or look at them, and fair enough, each time it was linked to a certain collectors that happened to be uh, a client of Divine. So when I decided that I wanted to become a curator in the US, that I needed a PhD, I, it was just the, the subject that I wanted to study, this, this taste, and to study how this great phenomenon of um, a migration of objects and taste from Europe to the US uh, was basically, to study that, I wanted to anchor it with a great dealer, a great dynasty of dealers, and the Duvin were the perfect subjects. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. So, so also, you know, it probably wasn't as a baby uh, in the night table <laughs> reading, and it probably wasn't at work. Uh, was it here in the city at an institution, or was it maybe at, at one of your colleague collectors' homes that you 
you first saw this taste, saw this phenomenon? Well, I'm not exactly sure when I had become aware of the Duvines. Mm. Uh, but I remember very vividly the moment when the name became an issue in my mind. And it's, I was at the Frick, we were having a dinner, and I was sitting right next to Charlotte. And uh, I don't remember how the conversation went, but I ended up describing something that you'll get a kick out of that in retrospect now I think of my Duvine moment. Uh, and I was, this goes back to 2004, I was renovating my townhouse on 79th Street, and they had just about finished the construction, but not completely, and the drawing room, which is a fairly large room, about 35 or so feet long, about 25 feet wide, there was nothing in it, they had just finished it, uh, and I was considering a chandelier, uh, uh, a crystal chandelier, uh, but I was not too crazy about crystal chandeliers. And I had spoken to one of my dealers who happened to be a very, I always thought very highly of him. Uh, some of you probably know him, Alan Rubin. Yeah. I thought he was very creative. He always had some of the most uh, creative stands at Maastricht and other fairs. And he had a crystal chandelier, and he said, uh, he asked if he can come and see me. And I said, sure. So we're in this, my drawing room, as I said, big room, picture, nothing in it. And it's got these three windows on the south side, big windows with walls between them. And uh, Alan and I were talking about various things, and then he started talking to me about peer mirrors. And he told me how the French started this, and then the British took over and you know, developed this process. And I got very interested, and we spent about 10 minutes talking about it. And at one point, I realized what was going on. And so Alan was standing at the other end of the room, and I was around here. And I turned around to Alan, and I said, Alan, I said, I bet you have a pair of mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> So Alan looked at me, gave me a nice smile, and he said, well, he said, as a matter of fact, I happen to have a pair of mirrors. And they're actually now in my uh, drawing room, and they fit perfectly to the extent that I've had people ask me who made them for me because they fit so perfectly that, you know. Like, anyway, so I explained that. I, I Somehow, uh, the conversation with Charlotte was such that I went and told Charlotte this story. And then we obviously connected it. She was just finishing the book or? I was finishing getting... the PhD. Well, I was in the middle of thinking of writing the <laughs> book from yeah. my PhD. Yeah. I was into Devine, yeah. OK, so we ended up into Devine. And I got very interested in Devine. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll phone. And I forgot what I said, <coughs> but I would phone half the of book. the cost or? Yeah. No, no, that's it. Initial, I was, yeah, I was telling initial, you, okay. yeah. the real story is that you're right. I was finishing the book, and we needed uh, a sponsor. And you very, very generously said, I will do it. Yeah. So thank you. So that was kind of my introduction to yeah. the They had a pure, yeah. And after that, of course, I got And she had a book. <laughs> yeah, and I had a book. <laughs> well, you've been right. trained. That's wonderful. Right. Right. Well, Rebecca, we were talking about Wellesley and, and the role that uh, Wellesley's played in the, uh, the, the promulgation of, of uh, people interested, so interested in, in the history of decorative arts that they make a career of it, whether it's my mother-in-law or, or a long time ago or more recently you. And I was wondering, was Duveen part of the fodder uh, for you as an undergraduate or was it something that, that came along the way? Um, it came along the way, um, even though I did study decorative arts and as an undergrad. It really came at the MFA in Boston mm -hmm. starting in 2007. Um, the MFA had some significant pieces in the collection uh, that came from Duveen, like for instance, some of you may be familiar with Monet's La Japonaise, an iconic piece at the MFA. We also have, uh, or the, the MFA uh, conserves several pieces of Maiolica that came from the Morgan collection uh, and acquired through Duveen, so in doing a lot of research for some renovations and new installations in the galleries, that's sort of when the initial uh, exposure occurred. And then um, 
it was eventually uh, evolved and progressed uh, through my research in, um, in the Blumenthal's. They were not, um, George and Florence Blumenthal were not um, the biggest clients of Joseph Devine, like Frick and Morgan and Huntington and Mellon and some of the other names, which I'm sure will come up in today's talk. And I became fascinated with why certain collectors, uh, they did acquire some tapestries, mostly from Duveen, but they were really in the circle of Berenson, Frederick Mason Perkins, and Jacques Seligman, and there seemed to be a little bit of distrust there with, with the Duveen uh, gallery. Mm -hmm. And I became sort of fascinated why certain collectors, um, and specifically Jewish collectors working with Jewish dealers, I focused a little bit on the Jewish identity of the Blumenthal's and collecting in the, in the first quarter of the 20th century. I became quite interested in why some collectors really relied on the Duveens for uh, decoration and building a, a collection and even leading to large bequests uh, in museums while others sort of chose to work with other colleagues and competitors. Um, it's when I arrived at uh, Hillwood in 2018 that I, um, having had a uh, preliminary interest in female collecting, um, began to research <coughs> more objects uh, in, in greater depth that Marjorie Meriwether Post um, acquired um, from Duveen. Um, I was really interested in how this woman who um, was born in Springfield, Illinois, who um, lived then in Battle Creek, Michigan, the only child of C.W. Post who amassed this fortune and Post cereal company, uh, arrived in New York uh, at age 28 from Connecticut and where this, and amassed uh, quite a collection of French decorative arts in the, in the 20s and where this, this started at the root and it really goes back to um, Duveen's tutelage. And so um, we have some archives in the Post family papers, um, which I can read a little later, um, about that relationship and how he really um, educated her in her early years um, and even supplied um, maps of the Louvre and um, picture books and uh, notes on painters, French 18th century painters, and different schools uh, to educate her in, in the, her early formation of collecting. So, uh, and that relationship continued well into the 50s and 60s when she acquired Hillwood, which is now Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. So she bought, she was buying from him for a, lot, a very long time. Well, I'm really glad that you brought up uh, both suspicion on the one hand and then Duveen as a teacher. And, and I actually want to go back to Charlotte and say, when, when you embarked on your research, uh, what did you think one might find uh, in the Duveen business records? And then how was that undoing of other things we thought we knew about Duveen uh, from the many books that have been written and, and a lot of the lore that, that uh, goes around him? So, of course, before starting, because one of the greatest things with the Duveen brothers is the archives are available and were actually became available just at the moment when I studied my PhD. So everything is on microfilms in three locations in London, in France, and in Paris, uh, Paris, London, and New York, and the Getty as uh, the original. Um, so it's very possible, it's really possible to do really in-depth uh, studies. So of course I read all of the books that you have all read and, um, and they're fabulous because they, they create uh, a phenomenon and they describe, they create a legend and a and hero. And my, because it was my research, it's a PhD, so I wanted to get rid of these. I wanted to go in the book and the stocks and, and, and go beyond the personality and also was wondering if the personality is just that or, or what was happening. And I really insist, and it's a huge part of my book, it's not only Joseph Duveen. That was a very, very solid um, firm uh, created by his father and uncle and Joel and Henry had a crucial role in putting together that, that very, very important um, Firm. And of course, Joseph Devine came with his personality and, and changed everything in many ways. But the, 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 the two, Joel and Henry, also did something very, very sorry. So I was really looking at <clears throat> inventories, uh, letters, uh, trying to go away from 
all of the gossips, all of the stories that exist have been circulated with no footnotes. It's only people telling something from second hands. And, mm -hmm. and, and of course, there is a member of the family, Henri Duvin, who also published several books on it. So everything was so loaded and so personal that I needed to go back with the, the, the written uh, records, the numbers, uh, inventories. So I try to kind of separate myself from, from all of this story for a while to reconsider. Um, that's why my book might be very dry. <laughs> in comparison with all of the others. It's um, not dry at all. It's marvelous. But, but, but I, uh, Alexia, I thought maybe you could speak to this matter of, you know, when your family name is associated with a certain brand of dealing, uh, how does that uh, shape uh, your own entry? When, when you become there, you inherit a reputation, you inherit maybe some stock and maybe some clients, but, but how do you take uh, the best of what came before and make it new and make it fresh for today? Um, you want to talk how about... How do you personally, how did you do that? Because you've done it, my friend. No, 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 not, a, no, no, uh, not at all. Um, we, we, um, no, I thought we were talking about Devine. So, <laughs> no, I'm, the, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed. Same thing. <laughs> same, same, same. Um, no, it's uh, what is fascinating. Uh, if, if I may say the exact opposite, as uh, as always, as, <laughs> as Charlotte, uh, no, no, is is looking at the personality because uh, uh, one beyond everything else, I mean. Ex expertise is one thing, uh, uh, um, the, the, the stock, the work, the, the, the galleries, but uh, I, I think it, it goes down to, to really personality, and in the case of Devine, uh, some kind of charisma. Yeah. Uh, he was certainly a fascinating uh, character. It's a pity that there's no footage, film footage, record, or anything. There is this extraordinary and in a somehow unique existence of these archives in a time before the, before the, 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 the mobile phone, uh, w where everything happened with telegrams. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, we have an, an, a, a private insight of, uh, although they love to use code names and codes, uh, we still do, actually, it's, it's fun. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, nicknames for collectors and codes for yeah. prices or whatever. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but all this is visible uh, to, for the next generations of, uh, of uh, historians who will want to, to, to work on the, uh, on the art dealers of the, the early 21st century. Everything is gone in the SMS and, uh, and, and, and mobile phone, all, all this essence of the, of the dealing that's available with Devine. It's kind of incredible. And I just, uh, as, as you've thought about it, don't be embarrassed at all. What, what you're doing is so important. Um, what you and the other people who are associated with this fair are doing is so important, is that you're building those connections back together. You're reweaving the trust in the art market in a way that otherwise uh, you know, cannot be done. Uh, codes or no codes, uh, I think that the suspicion around the art market is, has been shifted by Tefaf, and I, and I hope it continues to go in this direction. Um, slightly different question. Here we are, almost 2020. You know, Duveen had this amazing effect that totally dominated in a monolithic way, the way the top collectors uh, were collecting. They all wanted old world style uh, residences for various reasons that Charlotte talks about in the book and that many of you know from the institutions that you love. Um, just how defining do you, do you think that style was? Just, just how powerful a force uh, in the end do you think we can, we can actually claim for Duveen? I want to start with Rebecca on that one. Um, well, in the case of Marjorie Merriweather Post, it was um, an instrumental influence, as I mentioned early on. Um, she arrives in Manhattan um, uh, 28 years old. Um, her father, in 1915, her father had just passed away um, in 1914, so she inherits um, a tremendous fortune and uh, the CW Post, the, the Postum Serial Company. Um, she uh, is living, residing at that period on the corner of 92nd and 5th in Burden Mansion. 
um, which she rents in the beginning of the first few years and then ultimately buys. Um, this is during her first marriage to Edward Bennett Close. Mm -hmm. And it's really um, in 1919 when she divorces Edward Bennett Close and marries E.F. Hutton that her relationship with Duveen begins. Uh, first, her first acquisition was a Flemish tapestry. Um, and that's when I think this relationship of tutor student develops. Um, it, he is um, she, uh, not instrumental in um, helping her acquire in the, uh, especially starting in 1926, when Burnham Mansion is actually torn down and the building that exists today, 1107 Fifth Avenue, um, her private entrance was 2 East 92nd Street, but the building, uh, the official address is 1107 Fifth, which is still in existence today. She had the top three floors, triplex apartment, transferred her, uh, the layout of her mansion to the top three floors of this building, 54 room apartment. Um, and it's really during that period that she starts to travel more extensively and acquire pieces from Duveen. And he's instrumental in creating that uh, period room look, especially for her French drawing room, which she repeats. Um, I don't know how many of you know many of her residences and interiors. We're actually working on a, hopefully a book in a few years' time at Hillwood on the many houses of Marjorie Post, so putting Hillwood in, in context. Um, but she repeats uh, a lot of the, um, the, the look, the Duveen look, sort of the English library, uh, the paneled, the Louis XV paneled dining room, the Louis XVI paneled drawing room. Um, she acquires uh, five Boucher tapestries that are integral into the architectural decoration of this New York uh, apartment, which then f f travel with her and, uh, and ultimately in are very important uh, integrations into Hillwood estate today. Um, they also developed a friendship, which I think is very interesting because I don't know that he was necessarily a friend of Frick's or socialized with Frick's or other collectors. It's, I'm curious to know from Charlotte if that was true. Um, 1926 um, was the uh, sort of uh, open house party uh, that Marjorie organized at 2 East 92nd Street when Frick and his wife were there. And I have a letter if you oh, would yeah, like yeah, me to, to read, which I think is, <laughs> Very touching. Um, this is dated April 30th, 1926. So the, the, the housewarming party uh, was, it was held on April 29th. So this is just the following day. Um, and the Metropolitan Opera was there for entertainment and it was a dinner and a dance. So it's, um, my dear Mrs. Hutton, I feel I must write you a few lines to express the very great pleasure my wife and I derived from your wonderful entertainment last night. The music was great, most artistic, and chosen with rare skill and excellence of taste. The whole ensemble was a dream of delight, in fact, fairyland. I shall never forget, when I entered the drawing room with my charming hostess greeting me, what an impression was conveyed to me. For although I had seen the room before, I had never seen it in the evening, or with flowers, or with the exquisite lighting, so soft and so discreet. In addition to this, with the beautiful women there, so well represented, my wife tells me the gowns of which I know little were enchanting. I have been to many great events in my life all over the world, but I have never seen anything more refined and exquisite than last night. The effort and time which you must have extended, I as a man for detail can appreciate. I know what it means. With my kind regards to my host and hostess, hostess believe me, yours sincerely, Joseph Duveen. So I think that really um, not only elucidates the, the, the decoration and the room, which the, probably the French drawing room, which he knew quite well and helped decorate, um, but I think it really um, shows uh, a social connection and relationship as well. Well, thank you. Also, a, a, a question. I mean, a fairyland, exquisite and refined. <laughs> Duveen's words. That's what you've created in, in your residences, and I'm, I'm just, just wondering if the impulse for that uh, how long it took for you to have that vision for what you wanted to be collecting and that environment that you wanted to be shaping uh, for others. And, and if, if you could offer a few words about, about how that developed and how large the Duveen taste loomed in it. I'm not sure about how much I may or may not have been influenced by Duveen. I'm kind of fascinated by the Duveens. I mean, you know, there's so many 
aspects of their characters, Alexis said, I mean, they're just larger than life. Uh, I mean, they created a market, then they proceeded to exploit that market extremely successfully. And one of the things I find interesting about the Duvines is uh, the dynamics of the relationship between them and their clients. Because we tend to think about the Duvines as being manipulative in a positive sense. Uh, but if you think about Henry Clay Frick and DuPont, I mean, Morgan, Morgan etc., uh, these are not guys that you can manipulate easily. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of wonder who was manipulating whom. Indeed. <laughs> and they were both bringing something to the table in this transaction that they both wanted. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I, I and I find that, as I said, the dynamics of the relationship between Duvin and these clients is very interesting. Uh, that's your second book. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think it's very true, and it yeah. come on what you both said. It's like I think they were very different for everyone. I mean, Joseph Duvin was definitely uh, much more manipulative with women. Um, uh, and his relationship was completely different when he dealt with Arabella and Tington or, or, or with um, the Dodge or, or with uh, J.P. Morgan, who actually didn't want to deal with Joseph Duvin. And it was Henry in the, um, in, the, in the firm who had to deal with Morgan because Morgan was not a man that wanted to... It, it was too much for him. So I think it's, uh, the, the relationship were, were sincere, very, very sincere and very personal. Um, there were, we discussed that yesterday night, and we're wondering if there is a sense of conscious manipulation or if it was just, just the way they were. But I don't think he came up with an, uh, an agenda. It, yeah. I think it was more like yes. fluid. And, uh, but also what you both said, and I think it's one of the main strategy of how the Duveen, the three-grade Duveen, came to be successful, is their relationship with interior decoration. Yes. So not only they transfer a European taste in America, but they understood that the way of placing so many objects and seducing uh, a, a certain a clientele was through interior decoration. They were making rooms. And it was not, they were not interested in placing one sculpture or one painting or one work of art. It was a look. Yeah. It, was, it was the look that existed in many ways already in Europe and was pretty well established. They just transfer it. And by doing it, they also took the greatest artisan and interior decorator from Europe to do the job here. So, and, and this idea of your, your, your mirrors is true because I said, oh my God, it's exactly what happened when Duvin was doing that. It was, you, you cannot bring, you know, and you can tell the story, but you cannot just bring a Rembrandt in a room that has nothing else. Right. You need to, you need to, to work the, 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 the house. You need to work the, so I don't know if you have something to say on that, but that is, does it still exist today? I, I don't know, but that is really what happened with the Duvin. And, and the fact that they played it quite openly. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, like when Duveen bought the Fragonard the Progress of Love from Morgan yeah. and he yeah. paid one and a quarter million and he sold it to, to Frick at cost. Yeah. He actually told him that he was, well, I'm not sure that he told him, but he didn't hide the fact that he was selling it to Frick at cost. And clearly Frick knew that this guy's not giving him a million and a quarter artwork at cost because he just loves the way <laughs> he looks. <laughs> uh, and so there is this relationship that they both expect to get something out of it, and it's very open, it's, yeah. it's very, you know. And he had to deal with great dealers, uh, with great bankers, yes. and great businessmen. Yes. And he was himself a great businessman. Yes. So they were at a level yes. of understanding that was, as you said, he totally knew that at one point, Frick was going, uh, du Duvin was going to make some money out of this deal. Uh -huh. And he did, big, actually. Exactly. But, but I didn't completely answer your yeah. question. Uh, in terms of what I have created, I, uh, I, I, I can't, I don't know how it started, to tell you the truth. Uh, but it, uh, it uh, uh, I refer to as a collector, I refer to myself as a collector often, 
But in a different way, I don't even think of myself as a collector because what I've done is I've created an environment in which I like to live. Uh, and entertain and raise money for good causes. Yes. You do all those uh, things. It's, right. But, but it's, all, it's all part of that, 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 that thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Charlotte, you, you, you brought up, uh, in, both in the book and, and just now, you're <coughs> talking about the different role for women. And uh, it's interesting, uh, looking through the things at the Clark during my time there uh, and, and, and seeing how the firm was entirely run by men, but that both their sources... Uh, their points of contact with the sources was often the women in the family in Europe, and that the destination that closed the deal here in the States were often women, whether they were European immigrant, high-born women, or, uh, or, or uh, ingenues. So I, would, I was wondering if you could speak just a few words about, about what, what, did, uh, uh, what was the vision that the women were trying to create in these grand homes like Linwood Hall, in these grand homes uh, uh, like Hillwood? Harris, power, aristocracy, back to Marie Antoinette, oh, mm. empress of Russia. I mean, they all wanted to create their own project, their own fantasy. I mean, look at Dodge. <laughs> I mean, it's just they wanted to create their own Create, you, I mean, when you create a space, and we're at Morgan over there, we, you, you, you project your own persona into this object and these spaces. And, and I think Duvine, the Duvine really played extremely well that. And each of them were slightly different because also the location, if you create a place in Florida, in New York City, in California, in Chicago, or Detroit, it's different, or in Paris. So I think he played very well with very subtlety um, how all of these were similar and different, uh, and, and how the dreams or the fantasy of what all aristocracy of Europe was, and, and starting at the top, I mean, each time he wanted to start um, educated uh, collectors, and especially these women, there were, he was sending them and having trip with them in France, going to, to Versailles and the Chateau, and having like the greatest collector of the time opening their house. So they wanted them to see what was happening in Europe so they can you know, relieve or recreate their own fantasies. It's, it's a lot of decors. After why there were no more women working at Duvine, I think it's a period of time, there were really very few women working. But in the network, there were two fabulous women. Um, one a decorator, Elsie de Vol, who was not working mm -hmm. directly with them, but she was, she was very much into the, the network. And Belle da Costa Green, who was yeah. um, Morgan's um, circuit, uh, library, who was very, very strong woman who had to deal with uh, Duvine on a professional level. It's interesting. I thought you. I thought you might say that they were trying to extend a sense of civilization and, and properness, uh, along with it. But the I word, think it's the word that. fantasy, uh, yeah. and and very ambitious. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, you read and you look at Marie Antoinette. She was doing the same thing. I mean, she was redoing. I think it's when you have powers and certain wealth, you 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 project yourself with your interior. So that's why the, the key things, I think it's really the interior decoration. Because it was not only forming a collection, it was really creating uh, a living space into which these people reflect uh, themselves and, and where they stand in society. Fabulous. Well, I know that we have a, a little time for questions, and you've all been so wonderfully patient in waiting to ask them. But uh, I open the floor. Linda's got a mic, if you would. My question concerns the Devines, and how did they actually get entry to all these people, the Mellons, the uh, Fricks, the Morgans, and how did they maintain that relationship, and was there any competitive uh, aspects from other people that were trying to also gain entry, these individuals? Let's start with, with, with Charlotte on that one. Yes, so it's, it's, it's a long, long, um, you know, you cultivate relationship, uh, sometimes by chance, sometimes. Uh, for example, the person who introduced Morgan to Duvine received 10% of everything that Morgan, that Duvine sold to Morgan later on. And I still don't know who is that person. Mm -hmm. I think it's Sellingman. Because there is some money after each payment, um, big money uh, payment made for Morgan Duvin, there is something going to the, the selling man. But it's so everybody, it was a network 
of people introducing people and, and working, working things. Um, and, and after how do you maintain it? It's, it's, it's again, it's a, it's a real relationship. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, they each, they use many different kind of strategies. Offering exactly what the person wants is one of them. Uh, you look for uh, something and you are the only one uh, uh, finding. You have someone telling you, I want a Rembrandt or I want an El Greco. And Divine will have 20 people in Europe to make sure that the El Greco is available. He buy it and he offer it. So it's, I don't know, do you have a perspective yeah. well, there, on that? There are more cunning stories uh, uh, also in, in the various books about how Devin would meet the, his, uh, uh, the collectors, uh, how, how he would pay off doormans, uh, 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 butlers. Uh, there's a famous story of how he, he managed to meet uh, Mellon because he knew in what hotel he was uh, staying, and he uh, managed exactly at a sharp second to uh, run into the same elevator by chance with Mellon, <laughs> and just between floors, uh, he was able to introduce himself, and, and, and that started a, 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 a lifetime relationship. So, but I think it's a little bit the same today. I mean, you meet people... I don't you, pay butlers so much. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't, take the, you don't do the elevator thing. But I mean, you meet collectors that may the Elevators are too fast. <laughs> <laughs> but Rebecca, I mean, uh, 20 years later, uh, there you have this person of fabulous wealth. I mean, did she just walk into his dealership or was there no, an introduction? We don't, I don't actually know how they first met either. I like to think she, her first big purchase when she arrived in New York, um, 20, 29 years old, she purchased a Rubens uh, painting. Um, so she actually started collecting you know, old masters before she, decorative arts, um, which is today at the St. Thomas uh, Church on Fifth Avenue. For those of you that uh, would like to go see it, that was, one of, that was her earliest purchase. Um, by herself at auction in 1917. So I, I suppose possibly either he was in the sale room or um, the sale, the purchase price was quite high and it was reported in the press um, that she had paid a substantial amount and it was sort of her arrival in New York as this Midwestern sort of, you know, um, woman come, arrive, arriving in New York as this very wealthy uh, beginning to collect. And I, it's possible that he was very aware of that uh, press preview, oh, <laughs> press sure. release, and um, also tried to solicit uh, himself to her at that point. Um, she did receive letters um, during uh, following the, um, the teardown of Burden Mansion when she was decorating this new triplex apartment. She did receive many letters from French and Company and uh, others uh, um, asking for, for her patronage or to consider employing them for the decoration. So it's possible that he was one of those as well. Great question. Thank you. Are there other questions? In the, in the back? Was there this period where uh, unique in history in the sense that material was available in Europe and there were extremely wealthy people uh, in, the, in the United States uh, before the uh, graduated income tax? Um, and uh, so was, was this a very special uh, period that perhaps could never be reproduced again? Uh, and if, um, if Duveen was, you know, stood out uh, at this period, who, if anyone, today would be in that kind of special category? Which dealer would be, in, or what dealers would be? Mm -hmm. Th thank you. It's, it absolutely, you, you, you intuit the, the precise situation. It was a historic moment of the ability of people to export extreme wealth and a tariff positive uh, atmosphere to import. But I, I like the end of your question, so let's try to, to try that with the panel. So uh, it's really about clientele and about sources uh, at the same time. Um, we, we talk about uh, who the people are that are going to move the needle, but uh, Alexi, maybe you have perspective on what, where, are the, where is the greatest influx of clientele happening, or if you want to answer, where is the greatest source? But you don't have to answer the greatest no, source. The, 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 um, um, it's very hard to, to uh, 
imagine a, a similar situation today only because the, um, the old master paintings and the, and the French decorative art uh, uh, and in Renaissance uh, Italian art altogether were the, 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 the most fashionable things uh, to one could acquire at the time. Uh, in today's, uh, 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 today's world, they're a fraction of the, of the art market. So if you really want to, to, uh, to find a, a parallel, obviously uh, the parallels must be found today in the contemporary art world, which, is, uh, which has taken over as the most fashionable uh, 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 art uh, to buy, meaning everyone, everybody wants to buy the same thing. Uh, that's what fashion is. Um, so uh, probably an obvious uh, figure, uh, comparable figure, would be Larry Gagosian, who, uh, who I don't know personally, but uh, it's the first uh, uh, name that, that comes to mind. Uh, in, if, I, if I may add something to the personality of Devine, uh, um, and maybe to some extent uh, uh, people that followed him, uh, uh, he was... More, more than a tutor or a mentor, uh, I would describe him as a guru to, to, uh, to uh, uh, some of his clients, meaning that he, he basically, um, how should I put it, uh, 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 people of Im immense wealth at the time uh, had uh, all, all their relationships, with, interaction with other people were, were only a hierarchy. Uh, uh, only depending on, on, on the, the, the business side. Suddenly they meet someone who is at the same social status uh, le level, I mean, or above, um, and, and who start to tell them what to think or what to do. And it's certainly a, a, a shock to, to, to uh, a brilliant businessman who had never been told what to do by anyone, uh, uh, that uh, uh, if, they, if they give up on it, if they accept the tutorship, the mentorship of the, or the guru, uh, uh, then they become, uh, um, but to their own benefit and with their uh, uh, own will, uh, completely uh, dependent to, to, uh, to Devine. And it goes, uh, uh, there's a lot of stories where you, it shows that it goes much beyond Art, Devine will, will say, uh, uh, look at your horrible uh, uh, Tudor mansion. We'll, uh, I'll introduce you to Stanford White. We'll tear it down. <laughs> we'll fix all this. <laughs> uh, uh, not fix it. No, no. Not fix it. Tear it down it's and build good. a petit Trianon uh, uh, French uh, pavilion. Uh, and, uh, and Carlion will do the interior decoration. And by the way, look how you're dressed. Uh, uh, it's, it's awful. I'll introduce you to my several row uh, tailor, and... Um, the food, you don't have the right <laughs> chef. And the food, uh, and... Uh, the cigars. Uh, the cigars. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and as it happened, and your ugly daughter, uh, I know a few uh, old uh, European aristocrats uh, who would be very happy to, <laughs> to, marry. To, to, to marry her. Uh, uh, no, the, I mean, this is, this is really how, uh, as I say, it's, uh, it's uh, two mutual benefits. Uh, uh, how I think uh, the, the, the relationship uh, uh, was installed between Devine and some... Uh, but to rebound on the, the question and to follow on, on you, Alexei, it's, it was really a very special moment in history. And, and at least for the old master and even for uh, the contemporary arts, I don't think it could be duplicated again. I think uh, Glenn Laurie uh, mentioned that or wrote it in the preface of the new edition of the Bernard Duvin's book, that it was a time when Europe has plenty of work of art or art, and, and America has plenty of money. And also because of the law um, in between uh, the protection of patrimony in Europe and the um, importation law in, in Europe were favorable for all of that happening. It was also at a time when all of the cultural institution in America was 
being created. I mean, it was at the time when the Met started to exist, was founded, plus many more museums. So it was public institution, it was private collectors. There was this, this desire here and needs of, of really culture at many, many different le levels. So it was, it, was, it was really historical too. Great. Larry goes. <laughs> Could there be a Duveen today? Well, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the, the four mega galleries in the contemporary world, uh, but I, I dare say that uh, this fair gives me great hope that uh, the old masters have a large place in the future of collecting, uh, and that non-Western as art, as opposed to non-Western as ethnography, is, uh, is something that's really come, come into vogue. Uh, so yes, I think there I think there could be, but maybe there isn't such a monolithic taste. Maybe there's a greater variety, but, but I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe my colleagues have a different opinion about the singularity that everyone, you know, cult-like, as Alexi puts it, <laughs> uh, everyone follows this, uh, this guru. Uh, I'm not sure we have that right now. Do, do you have an opinion on that? I think there's, um, in the case, again, going back to Marjorie Post, collecting, especially knowing at the, when she buys Hillwood Estate in 1955 that it will become a public museum, mm. um, Frick doing the same, I mean, a lot of the, Blumenthal doing the same, um, uh, building his house on Park Avenue as an extension, ultimately to become an extension of the Metropolitan Museum, um, which sadly didn't happen. I think that that um, doesn't exist today the way that it, it did. Um, there are certain collectors, I'm sure, that um, uh, would like to see collections and work with curators and other advisors to um, to to uh, ultimately, I think, uh, go to a museum. But I think that it seems the trend are a lot of private museums, especially of contemporary art. Um, I can speak to one in the Washington area that I've begun to, I've begun to, to visit more regularly now is Glenstone Museum. Those of you that have been to Glenstone, the foundation, um, which is a private collection of, of contemporary art uh, and sculpture and uh, uh, sculpture park uh, that is now open to the public. Um, so I think that seems to be uh, not to, you know with the Broads and the various um, other types of collecting uh, initiatives to create their own museums. I think there was one more question up in the front, and then we have to we have to end. I know. I was curious with the collectors, with the numbers of collectors in Europe, as well as in America. There must have been great competition, even although there was um, a lot available to buy, and each of them discussing and knowing which each other are buying. Um, how did Duveen decide, or how did he manage um, the competition? And one other thing, too, I wanted just to make mention, if you don't mind. I think collecting today cause we, is, is different, because I don't think a dealer will come in and, do the furn and help you buy furniture and help you buy all of the decorative arts. These private museums are mostly about um, paintings, drawings, and sculpture, in my opinion. So I think we're living in very different times, in more eclectic times. But anyway, that's... So to come back to your question, it's a very, it's, I think at the time it was something fabulous, is because the, the dealer was so powerful, and I think now maybe actually the reverse of, of power, it's the collectors maybe now the more powerful, but... Uh, so the dealer was so powerful that they were offering, there were this notion of first refusal, so you, you, if you are the lucky collector in which Duveen is going to offer you that piece, you cannot say no. So it doesn't exist anymore. You have the Rembrandt, you have the Vermeer. Maybe in contemporary art. Maybe in contemporary art. Yes. Yeah, I don't know the contemporary art field, but that will be the moment of ultimate power when you just have the piece as a dealer, you bring it to the collector, and if the collector say no, the dealer is not going to offer you again the first rate piece. Absolutely. And when now, I think there is more like a diffusion or, or, or of power and, and tension. But there were really this, so that he was placing specific object to certain, and sometimes he was offering the same group of object to two main collectors, and we know that with Duvi, uh, Frick and, and Rockefeller in certain cases, or Morgan. That was when they knew it was a big mess. But he, he, it was very much placing certain object to certain collection. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and the collectors, I think, at a certain moment could not say no because they knew that it was what they needed to buy at that moment. Well, that was kind of unique. That's guru. Thank you. That's uh, Totally. <laughs> we have to buy it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I want to just uh, uh, lead the thanks to Rebecca, Asso, Charlotte, and Alexi. Thank you all so much. Thank you again. I want to remind you that this is up on Facebook as a live feed. If you want to go back, review some of the information or amazing insights of this panel on this topic, and then it will be up on the website permanently. So it's yours to enjoy, and please spread the word. If there are other people you think would be interested in this topic and, and this discussion, please let them know. Thanks once again, and another please big hand for this wonderful panel. Thank you.